Hey folks, welcome. Excited uh, to have you all here today. Um, my name is Yina Molang. Um, I am a product manager at 2021.ai, where I focus on our AI governance product um, and work across our entire platform as well. Today, we um, are joined by Anik Bose, who is a managing partner at BGV, which is an early stage VC firm that invests in enterprise AI. He is also the founder of EAIGG, which is a community of AI practitioners focused on democratizing the growth of ethical AI governance. The plan for me today is to give you a short high level overview of the executive order that just came out of the Biden White House. And then we'll follow this with a discussion with Onik to see how we think that this uh, executive order might play out in the US and the rest of the world and how it'll affect enterprises that are using AI systems. We've enabled the chat, so feel free to drop any questions you might have along the way, and we'll make sure to get those answered. If you are new to 2021.ai, um, 2021.ai has built the Grace platform, which helps organizations around the world develop, deploy, and maintain AI models. We support organizations in developing uh, what is now known as traditional uh, machine learning systems, as well as large language models, and these are all supported by our governance framework. We want to enable our clients to see value from AI-supported decisions while also ensuring the responsible use of AI um, to establish assurance and trust for their employees, their clients, and any of their stakeholders. So the executive order um, was introduced October 30th uh, by the Biden administration. It's the executive order on the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence. The goal was to develop standards and tools and tests that can help ensure AI systems um, are safe, secure, and trustworthy, which is something that um, we've talked a lot about at 2021 AI, and we're happy to see this kind of expand to a higher level and become more of a mainstream topic within the AI community, especially in the US. So the executive order really focused on eight high level principles. Um, so starting off, we had the new standards for AI safety and security. I will go a little bit further into this um, in a moment since that is kind of the most high level enterprise focused of the principles. And then two through eight, um, will have an impact on AI enterprises, but a lot of this is government and federal agencies getting guidelines that they need to get kicked into action and start um, sorting out on their own. Um, so as you'll notice, there's a really a, a big theme throughout all um, of the principles, which is like privacy um, and security for end users of AI systems and ensuring that those um, that could be impacted by externalities are minimized and that we're really just using uh, AI securely, both in the public space and in the private space. So this first, the first principle is these new standards for AI safety and security. Um, and as I just mentioned, a lot of the principles were aimed at government agencies and federal uh, agencies that need to take action. But the first one is really relevant to those of us who are making and deploying AI models at a large scale. Um, so developers of foundation models need to share their safety test results and other critical information with the US government, but with the caveat that this is dependent on the size of their models. Um, and none of the models that we've seen from OpenAI or the other LLM um, creators reach this size yet, but I think we will see that we'll get close to these sizes and have to start reporting to the government what they're doing. Um, alongside with that, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, is going to continue to develop standards, tools, and tests uh, that are focused on AI. They have already come out with a lot of frameworks, um, but I think we'll see them pick up the pace and, and get a couple more out there for us to try to adhere to. 
We also are seeing a lot of focus on biological materials. Um, so we want to make sure that these AI systems, the foundational models aren't used to create any harmful biological materials. Really relevant to a lot of uh, media work is the establishment of standards and best practices for detecting AI generated content through watermarking. I think you'll notice there's a little bit of an asterisk a lot of times when people are talking about this because there are, we have yet to seen tools be developed that are really, really good at watermarking. Um, so that's definitely somewhere where we'll see the impact um, of this uh, executive order kind of grow into some innovation. And then lastly, uh, cybersecurity is really a key piece of the exec the entire executive order. So I think we'll see um, a lot of move towards cybersecurity focused on AI tools um, and making sure that those who get to use these AI tools um, are not getting impacted by potential security breaches. And quickly, just to wrap up um, on the high level on the executive order, I think kind of looking forward, what we'll see is a lot of action on the federal level um, and hopefully tricking down, trickling down to the state level as well. But they need to start implementing these principles and kind of get these things rolling within their own departments. Um, one piece of the executive order, obviously, is that it is currently entirely voluntary uh, from the private sector perspective. And so we'll see a push for binding legislation to be created and passed in Congress. And alongside with that, we'll also need funding to be laid out and approved by Congress to support these initiatives that are being developed. And then from a really high level, we'll really need to see the ecosystem step up and acknowledge uh, these frameworks and kind of agree to work together to build um, AI systems that adhere to the security and privacy standards that we expect um, coming out of this executive order. Cool. Uh, now I want to switch over uh, and welcome Onik to the conversation. Um, I will let him introduce himself um, and give a little bit more detail on his background. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know. So uh, glad to be here today uh, discussing this important topic. Just to give you a quick context, as uh, Yine indicated, I'm managing partner at BGV. In early stage VC firm, we've been investing in uh, AI since uh, 2017. And um, what's been kind of interesting is, uh, you know, I would say probably even a few years ago, AI was pretty much a black box and there was not much awareness either in enterprises or even in startups around the risks and opportunities that come with AI given a self-scaling nature. Uh, but what's been interesting is with the launch of ChatGPT and OpenAI and a primary B2C use case around search and summarization, it's captured everybody's imagination. I think uh, I read recently a Morgan Stanley report that uh, close to about 20% of US households use uh, ChatGPT at least once a month, and they expect that to go up to 40%. So this is all good. It's, it's shedding you know, a spotlight on something that's important that we need to all deal with. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, to discuss that. So uh, uh, how do you want to proceed? Yeah, Go ahead. Um, I yeah. think we should just really start at a super high level. Um, I want to hear from you what you think the, the long-term effects will be of the executive order on AI development and especially the use of AI systems across different sectors. Great. So I think first and foremost, as you said earlier on in your preamble, uh, the executive order is really focused on the government. So I think first and foremost, I believe there's going to be increased adoption of AI in the government because uh, the order encourages different governmental agencies to embrace AI technologies for various purposes, all the way from improving uh, uh, public services to enhancing national security. Uh, I fundamentally believe that this, uh, at the very least, will lead to more AI deployment within government operations. So that I think is the first level. There are some important second order effects that I believe will also span into other sectors uh, in the commercial uh, in a space. If you think about the uh, US government, it's the largest customer in the US economy. And the federal government's you know, own purchasing requirements uh, often become industry procurement standards. So to the extent that uh, the US government starts putting in place purchasing criteria like compliance with NIST risk framework, uh, independent evaluation, uh, testing of vendors' claims, and other kind of criteria, 
that it becomes standards, it's important to realize that these could be adopted by many enterprises that will be procuring AI products. And this will impact both kind of tech incumbents who are selling AI products to enterprises. It will also impact startups uh, who are selling AI products to enterprise customers. So I think the second uh, important impact that I believe will happen. The third aspect I would say is data sharing. Uh, the order really promotes data sharing among government agencies to support AI research and development. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, there's a lot of issues on data privacy and how data gets shared. And fundamentally, to the extent that this adoption within the U.S. government increases data access and interoperability, it'll also kind of surface best practice innovation in this area that could be leveraged in other highly regulated sectors, whether that's financial services or healthcare, as they develop and uh, deploy uh, AI systems. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll definitely see a lot of public sector movement um, kind of trickling down AI. Uh, do you think there's a big difference between how large enterprises will tackle the principles that are laid out in the executive order and how smaller medium businesses might go about it? I think, uh, you know, from a principal perspective, not, but in terms of resourcing, yes. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So if you think about how and let's take Gen AI for, for an example. So if you think about how incumbents are dealing with Gen AI, they're actually bundling a lot of uh, AI features as part of the legacy applications, right? So whether it's Microsoft or whether it's Google or anybody else. And when you think about that, it's just a next version of an application that, that customers are using today. So for those kind of features, I think what's, what's important is the fact that, you know, incumbents will have to basically make sure that uh, as the existing customers go to the next version of their software, the next version of the applications, uh, they're addressing some of these issues. So I think, uh, and as, as you know, I fundamentally believe this is going to be the first wave of Gen AI kind of applications that kind of come out and get to scale, apart from what we're seeing in, uh, with kind of the large language models with people like, uh, you know, OpenAI. But I believe that, uh, you know, incumbents have a lot of resources, so they will kind of deal with these issues effectively and they'll be able to kind of work through it. I think startups is a little bit of a different equation because, uh, you know, when you think about enterprises procuring AI products, a lot of these uh, criteria have not kind of entered mainstream yet. The more savvy enterprises are trying to think about these issues, they're asking about things like, you know, have the products been tested with certain uh, frameworks? Uh, what kind of validation has been done for accuracy? Or are there issues around kind of uh, cybersecurity exposure or data leakage? But it's kind of all over the place. And I fundamentally believe that startups will, uh, will have a challenge as they try and sell into this market uh, till kind of some of the criteria around purchasing and evaluation of these products becomes more standardized. Very similar to what happened if you think about cybersecurity uh, there was no such thing as SOC 1 and SOC 2 compliance in the late 90s. Uh, and it's only when these things came to bear that, you know, cybersecurity started getting more widely adopted and enterprises could kind of get a sense on how to evaluate different startups who are selling these products. Yeah, that makes, that's a really good point. Uh, do you think that with kind of the explosion of open source LLMs and foundational models we're seeing kind of rise at the same time as the enterprise solutions that the there will be issues with the usage of open source. Do you think people will place limits on how you can appropriately deploy open source models? Or do you think that users and deployers of LLMs will still be able to feel comfortable um, developing and implementing open source just the same as they would a, an enterprise LLM like OpenAI's ChatGPT? Yeah, so I think if I abstract, the, take that a step back, I think any enterprises that use, uh, you know, any type of LLMs, there's two fundamental issues that they, they're kind of grappling with. First is guardrails, right? Uh, and the guardrails is, has to do with kind of, first of all, uh, how do I ensure kind of uh, this issue, there's the issues, fundamental issues on data poisoning, you know, data leakage, um, you know, even things like, uh, you know, AI security are, are addressed. And the second part of it is, is the fact that uh, as they actually deploy it, what kind of guardrails do they have in place that's being provided by the LLM providers that they can leverage to make sure these things are addressed. And uh, today, if you look at it, uh, you know, it's, you know, every enterprise has to kind of think through what their stack looks like. And while, uh, you know, different LLM providers are providing certain guardrails and certain some of these functionalities as part of their offerings, it's not standardized. So I think the enterprise has to look at their own LLM stack 
and the application and the use case, and they have to determine where they're at and whether an open source model or a closed source model makes sense. Uh, I believe that over time, when you think about these guardrails, whether they happen to be around cybersecurity or data privacy or other areas, um, it will require best of breed. And I believe this is where uh, you know startups can play and help. And I also believe there's a space that will kind of come about around orchestration of you know uh, LLMs. So you think about all these different agents and chatbots and co-pilots. Uh, how do you make sure these things work together or there's, there's not issues as they work together? And I think that's where startups can basically uh, make a difference. So as, as, as an enterprise, I would say they have to take a step back and really understand what the use case is, take a look at what the guardrail requirements are for them and the cybersecurity requirements are for them, and then understand which platform, whether it's open source or uh, you know more closed source, addresses that and what things they need to layer on top of that to make sure that they have trust in it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll really see some sort of layer going on top of all the separate LLMs that people are engaging with to man manage and control the flow of data and information to and from these LLMs. Um, I think there'll be an entire business um, in just making sure that LLMs work uh, within uh, a large enterprise. Um, so I think we'll definitely see something blow up there as well. Absolutely. Um, so putting on, I want to, I want you to put on your, uh, your ethical AI governance group hat. Um, how do you see the, the executive order and kind of the following discussions that we've seen in the community um, play a role in the, the continuous kind of discussion around the ethical use and development of um, AI technologies? Do you think people's mindsets are kind of changing or is there still kind of a challenge with really pushing the ethical use of AI um, rather than just being like, ah, oh, we're still innovating. Like we need to try to break things and for them to work. Yeah. So good question. Uh, as, as I think about it, at the highest level, this new executive order on the safe, secure and trustworthy development and use of AI, it really demonstrates the Biden administration is taking seriously its responsibility, not only to foster a vibrant AI ec ecosystem, but also to harness and govern AI. And so, so I think at the highest level, that's a very, very positive uh, uh, you know, message to take away. Uh, if I kind of parse that down to the next level, uh, if you think about ethical and responsible AI, the order does emphasize the importance uh, of this. And they look at, and they're asking the government agencies to say, you have to consider things like fairness. You have to consider things like transparency. You have to consider things like accountability in the AI systems. And fundamentally, as you said earlier, this will influence how uh, responsible AI gets uh, deployed within the public sector. So I think it's it's great as kind of a microcosm to show how this can be implemented and done uh, in the right way. So I think that's that's a very powerful kind of uh, lack of uh, you know better words, a subset of deployment responsible AI being driven uh, that I think the government will take seriously and others can draw from. So that's the first one. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing that we'll also see. Uh, is that I believe there'll be an acceleration uh, in innovation in the kind of what I would call the ethical AI landscape. And uh, if, as we've seen, the demand for kind of ethical AI services or responsible AI has skyrocketed in recent times. It's been in part due to some of the troubling practices that have been employed by large tech companies. And today, if I look, every day the media is full of news of you know privacy breaches, algorithm biases, AI oversights. So the public perception has shifted from a state of general obliviousness to a growing recognition that AI technologies and the massive amounts of data that power them poses some real risks, uh, whether it's to privacy, accountability, fairness, or transparency. So as I think about that, uh, I look at system integrators who are selling to the uh, public sector government today. I know that they're increasingly partnering with startup innovators to bring ethical AI innovations in the sector. I was speaking to folks at Booz Allen, uh, you know, I think a few months ago, and I know they're partnering with uh, a couple of startups, including folks like Credo AI, where they're fundamentally, you know, uh, bringing that into the government. Uh, as part of kind of uh, the Ethical AI Governance Group, we also publish uh, once a quarter a market map of ethical AI st startups that fall into four categories. Uh, you know, they fall into data for AI, uh, model ops, monitoring, explainability, AI audits, governance, risk, and compliance. And I can tell you, when we started tracking this uh, three years ago, there were maybe like 40 or 50 companies. 
today there's close to 225 startups in this and discovering these spaces. So I think it's going to accelerate the innovation ethical AI landscape as there's more demand for it, whether it's coming public sector or spillover from the enterprise sector. Yeah, I think one of the positive things that's come out of this boom with um, all the LLMs is that there's really a much higher level of recognition from the general public um, and others that AI can have issues. Um, before AI was like very abstract and we kind of knew it ran some things in the background, but now it's much more in people's faces and the mistakes that it makes are so much more obvious um, to just the lay person. So I think that's really kicked into gear having a lot more of these startups focused on helping solve those issues and people wanting to respect that and um, engage with those companies so that they create a better solution. And we kind of try to weed out some of these bias, um, bias outcomes or mistakes that we're seeing in the LLMs. Absolutely agree with you. Yeah. And so on the other side um, of your work as a, an investor, um, do you see that with, so there's obviously a huge boom in startups kind of focused on the ethical space. Um, but what other impacts do you think that we'll see from both the LLM boom and kind of the uptick in regulation discussion on the, the investment in the AI space in general? Yeah. So I think there's a few dimensions to this. Uh, first, first and foremost, uh, I will say, you know, if I think about AI security, uh, it's in the very, very early stages. I think there's a few startups that have got funded, um, you know, you know, over the last, uh, you know, year, year and a half and it's starting to pick up. But I fundamentally believe that uh, AI's role in enhancing cybersecurity is highlighted in this, in the executive order. And I believe that it's going to lead to increased deployment of AI powered cybersecurity solutions to protect critical infrastructure and sensitive data, especially when you think about energy and all those kind of things that the government focuses on. And I believe that by shining a spotlight on securing AI, it will actually promote further innovation in AI cybersecurity across the commercial sectors, where we are, as you said, early, at a very early stage today. So that's the first dimension. I think the second dimension that's a little, you have to kind of uh, dig under the covers a little bit is the fact that as investors, we have recognized that there's a shortage of AI talent uh, and that's a bottleneck to AI innovation, you know, whether it's in the startup sector or, or in the kind of the large uh, established tech sector. And when we look at kind of the fields of artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, the U.S. cannot afford, you know, self-imposed delays in attracting and retaining, you know, talent from across the globe, especially for those folks who have specialized skills. Uh, and I know that the executive order calls out for leveraging Schedule mm -hmm. A uh, for those occupations where the executive branch has already determined that the shortage exists as an easy way to advance U.S. interests and address the talent shortage issue that could rate limit you know, AI innovation in the U.S. So I think those are two tangible ways that the executive order will kind of foster uh, you know, kind of innovation in the startup economy, uh, both from a talent perspective, but also in terms of more specifically looking at uh, the AI security kind of uh, uh, space itself. Yeah, I think it's important that they've matched these like guidelines and principles with also some action on like, hey, we think we should do all these things and then also paired it with like, here are some ways to get uh, really high level researchers and engineers to also come to the US to implement these things. Because uh, I think many times we see a lot of, oh, we should take all these steps, uh, but there's no human power behind it to actually get these things done. Correct. And I think, you know, uh, I believe that this is a great start, but there's more work to be done. And I, I truly believe that when you, when you think about one of the examples that I saw when I read this was the fact that the order directs the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Homeland Security to really increase visa opportunities for experts in AI. Uh, and what's interesting is they've also directed the Secretary of Labor to publish a request for information to, sol to solicit kind of updates to the Schedule A occupation. So I think they're trying to basically do things, but I fundamentally believe that more work is required. But uh, this focus on immigration is spot on. I mean, it really is important because attracting AI talent is essential to micro technology leadership. And if what's interesting is in 2021, nearly 40% of US uh, doctoral recipients in science and engineering fields were temporary visa holders. Yep. Yep. Um, and it's hard to, I know I have friends in the academic sector and it's very hard to keep researchers here after 
they're done um, doing all their their PhDs or postdocs because the system isn't uh, adequately prepared to accept them into the industry or into further academic roles um, and setting people up, ourselves up for success with that would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to uh, switch topics a little bit, still focus on kind of the executive order, but I want to throw the EU uh, into the mix a bit as well. So obviously the EU uh, has really been leading the charge on data privacy regulations and AI regulations with first GDPR and then the EU AI Act. How do you see... On a, let's start with something, the positives. How do we see that the e U.S. executive order um, and the EU AI Act can work together to kind of set global standards for AI that raise the bar for privacy and data security? Yeah. So I think uh, let me start by kind of uh, talking about what some of the differences are and how they could complement each other. Okay. So from a co scope perspective, it's important to understand that the EU AI Act is a comprehensive legislative framework for AI regulation, while Biden's order really focused on government agencies and AI adoption within them. So, you know, it's a smaller subset. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, I fundamentally believe that how this gets deployed in the public sector could be a very powerful, uh, you know, example for the rest of the industry. So I think that's how I think it could kind of spill over. When I think about heightened scrutiny, there's a very important difference here, and it's early days, and it's not clear how this is going to evolve. But the you know executive order brings scrutiny based on the threshold of compute resource intensity for AI mm -hmm. uh, models. While if you think about the EU AI Act, it's really focused on applications which has demonstrated impact or harm in society. Uh, and it's not clear to many people you know why the rationale of compute resource intensity was used by the executive order, but I think it, it brings a different perspective as you think about this in terms of scale. And there's issues around kind of, you know, sustainability and resource issues and so on and so forth. But I think uh, these two things uh, taken together are complementary as opposed to saying the answer is A or the answer is B. But I think only time will tell how, how that evolves. I fundamentally also believe, you know, if you go to the, you know, the other part of the equation in terms of the regulatory approach, uh, as you said earlier, the EU AI Act establishes very specific legal requirements for AI systems, right? Including high-risk AI applications and contrast. Think about the executive order; it takes more of a voluntary and a regulatory approach, right? Emphasizing guidelines and best practices. So I think this is kind of very uh, tied into the culture of the differences between the US and the EU, where you know it's. Uh, you know, to me, it's, it's kind of very funny. One of my uh, startup CEOs once said, I think a few years ago at one of our meetings, he said, hey, you know, the EU regulates and uh, the U.S. kind of innovates. Um, so I think you have to find the right balance. And I think, uh, you know, finding these things, how they come together will, will get to the right balance. And I think uh, going back to your point on GDPR, I truly believe that there's a similar arc here. Where fundamentally, Europe took the lead on GDPR. But if you think about it, a lot of the principles and, you know, uh, the provisions and the clauses kind of came across in different ways in different time and different shapes and form, maybe not at a federal level, but at a state level and with California privacy laws and so on and so forth. So I think something similar will happen here. Yeah, um, I wanted to dig in a little bit on like the discussion around uh, regulating size versus um, application as we're seeing in the EU where we're really focused on like high risk uh, models. Um, how do you think the US should handle uh, the ability to still deploy, like small models can still have um, high risk applications. Do you think focusing on size is going to hinder some of that security and privacy benefits that we could maybe have seen if we had focused seen the uh, executive order focus a little bit more on risk application rather than just uh, amount of compute that it would take to build the model? Yeah, I think, I don't think it's an either or. I think uh, the right answer is to actually, it's a com combination. I don't think you can just focus on computer intensity and leave application out completely. I, I, I think uh, exactly for the reason that, that you mentioned. Um, so I think it'll be, that's why I said still more work to be done. It's early days, so we'll see how things evolve. Uh, but I fundamentally believe that uh, applications will really, really be important. So let's take a few examples, right? I mean, let's take healthcare. 
uh, if you think about healthcare, and let's say there's a AI uh, s a solution where fundamentally it's looking at you know um, images, X-ray images, uh, and you know you know prioritizing certain procedures or making recommendations to the doctor or to the physician, uh, you want to actually make sure. I mean, that's a high-risk application. So you want to make sure there's a human. Uh, you want to make sure there's uh, the data. There's no data bias. I mean, yeah, all those things have to be dealt with. So I, I think. Uh, you know, leaving that just to the industries to figure out on their own, uh, I think uh, is uh, is a dicey proposition. So I believe there will have to be some type of uh, you know laddering of risk for applications when it comes to U.S. regulations uh, around AI and factoring that in. Uh, having said that, uh, if you're in regular industries like healthcare, financial services, these guys uh, have very strong enforcement mechanisms. Uh, from the regulatory bodies to ensure that they're kind of uh, enforcing the right thing. So I very much doubt that regulators and financial services will allow people to willy-nilly start applying, you know, AI models for, you know, hedging or loan evaluation and things like that without kind of having the right things in place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to also turn a little bit to the discussion around um, these, the UAI Act or the executive order, there's always there's always some comments around how regulation will stifle innovation. Um, how do you see that kind of playing out as obviously we live um, in a globalized world, but we still want to have um, AI dominance. We still want to be at the forefront of AI innovation. How do you think uh, people should think about that balance between regulation and still allowing for a uh, quick, rapid innovation? I think, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in what I call smart regulations. Uh, smart regulations means it's not like a, you know, a, you know book of like 8,000 pages, uh, but it's also not no regulation. So what do I mean by that? Uh, if you think about kind of what's happened in the U.S. Uh, around kind of smart incentives, uh, think about what's happened uh, with, you know, electric cars and what's happened globally with that around incentives and how that's driven that. If you think about kind of uh, solar energy and renewable energy and think about the role incentives, smart incentives that played in deploying that, I think there's powerful examples where we can see that smart regulation uh, can drive the right behavior. So I believe that has to be in place. I don't think you can kind of just say, well, toss it all out because, and let it be Adam Smith's invisible hand and hope that, you know, uh, you know, bottoms up, the right things will happen. And I think at the same token, you can't just stifle innovation by saying, uh, in order for any innovation to happen, you have to kind of follow this, like, you know, thousand page rule book before you do anything, because then there'll be no innovation happening at all. So to me, it's all about smart regulation and it's finding the right balance. And since AI is self-governing, I think the rule, uh, the rule of smart, uh, you know, regulation will be very, very important. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I want to just end with one more question for you before we open it up for questions from the audience. Um, so we we obviously saw the executive order um, and it's at the moment voluntary and we're kind of waiting for Congress um, to take up the baton and create um, legally binding legislation, but also looking at kind of at Congress's current state and also the fact that we have a presidential election next year the likelihood of seeing a full force um, U.S. based legislation is probably quite like low. Um, so we, yeah, likely won't see a, a really legally binding thing uh, regulation anytime soon. Do you think that with the implementation of the EU AI Act in Europe next year, that we'll see um, some leakage of people adopting um, that framework into the U.S. and seeing U.S. based um, enterprises adhering to the EU AI Act and bringing that into their U.S. solutions as well. Yeah, so I think the first thing to realize about the EU AI Act is that the scope is very broad and they borrowed it from the GDPR. In fact, you know, it's well beyond European borders. And today, as you know, you know, most companies operate in multiple countries, right? So uh, yeah. if, if you're Salesforce, you're selling in Europe, you're selling in Asia, you're selling in the U.S. It's not just one geography. So I think fundamentally, a lot of the large global technology companies will have to basically, you know, uh, you know, address the issues that are being raised from, uh, you know, from the EU Act. So I think uh, EU Act. So I think that's that's one way that'll kind of uh, seep in. I think the second part of the equation is uh, fundamentally, as we talked about GDPR. I think about how GDPR came about was, you know, 
Europe took the lead, and it took a few years b uh, before it kind of started kind of you know influencing you know other parts of the world and similar regulations coming out. So I think there will be a time lag. Uh, you know what that time lag is. I think as you correctly pointed out, with kind of uh, state of affairs in the U.S. with regulation, with kind of uh, elections and things like that, it's probably not going to happen in the next you know uh, three you know two or three months. So it's likely you know at least at least a two to three year journey. Uh, but the last piece of it, I think, also, which is uh, really, really important, is the fact that when you think about um, regulations and, and how it, how it kind of comes about, it's uh, also there are companies in the U.S. Uh, who are kind of leading the charge. They're not waiting for regulators to tell them what to do. I would say Salesforce is a very good example of a company that fundamentally is really, really, uh, I've been impressed by the work they've been doing in Responsible AI. I've been very impressed by how they basically understand that the data set is their customer's data set and how they can layer on uh, you know, security, data privacy, and other issues to help their customers leverage that and do kind of innovative work. Uh, I know IBM is also doing a lot of that stuff. So I, I expect that, you know, as you see more and more kind of, uh, you know, shining examples of that from tech uh, companies, it, it'll kind of follow, that people will follow that. And last but not least, I think uh, this is kind of not very well understood, but if you think about, I'll take the analogy to cybersecurity. Uh, in the 1990s, no one could spell cybersecurity. There were no CISOs. And I can tell you by 2012, it was a different game. There were CISOs in every enterprise. It was a board level issue. There was a lot of uh, investment in cybersecurity and securing the enterprise. I can tell you the reason that happened was in the, you know, from 2000 to 2010, there was a lot of massive public failures, fines, breaches, firings. And while it hasn't happened on that scale in AI, I suspect a few of those things are going to happen. And when, it's nothing like those things happening that kind of force action and speed up regulation and make things happen. Yeah, absolutely. That is so true. Great. Um, I want to open up the the q a if anyone has any questions um feel free to pop them in there and we will get them answered otherwise um onik i if we could leave with a uh, one last piece of advice um what would you, how would you advise enterprises looking to establish AI systems in their enterprise or maintain um, strong AI systems? How, how should they go about governance and what do you think is probably the, the most important piece for them as they look to maintain um, AI systems that work for both their users um, and themselves at the end of the day? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Uh, I would say first and foremost, uh, what an enterprise needs to do is they need to basically look at the use cases and they need to look at the use cases along two dimensions. One is risk and the second is impact. And I think if you think about that two by two matrix, uh, to the extent they can identify high impact, low risk, or low risk, low impact, that's where they should prioritize uh, uh, the use of AI, whether it's LLMs or anything else. And I think that's a great way for enterprises to get their feet wet, uh, to figure out what their AI stack needs to look like, uh, to get some early wins, uh, to kind of uh, really, you know, get going. And I think that's the first thing I would say for enterprises to do. I think the second thing uh, to also do would be the fact that uh, it is by far a cross-functional exercise. So, for example, if you're an enterprise and you're looking to deploy AI, uh, you know, you've traditionally you've got either data scientists uh, or you've got people in the BUs driving some other stuff. Uh, but you have to understand that there's it's a sea change. And so, for example, if you want your AI to be secure, the the CISO needs to be engaged and they need to be brought into the organization. If you want to be deployed, if you want the AI to be deployed broadly, then you need to basically make sure that the cross-functional teams are engaged in that. So, I think those are two things I would say. If you're an enterprise, you need to really think through that. Which and it's more than just saying you got CEO buy-in. You have to make sure that you've got the right use cases and the right risk profiles, and you have to make sure that you have broad cross-functional engagement to drive the implementations. Because if you take a silo approach, you're going to have a surface area of attack you haven't thought about, or a weak spot that's going to come back and uh, you know bite you. Yeah, that is great advice. You really have to be AI um, from by design rather than AI just thrown in on top of some enterprise working. 
Correct. We we did get one question um, in the chat. Um, the question is that there was a piece in the executive order on advancing equity, um, diversity, inclusion, and anti-bias ethics, um, and et cetera. How does an executive order on managing risks in AI advance these topics? Um, or did the order leave this to the private sector to advance these issues? Yeah, so I think and I actually did see that. Uh, and it wasn't clear in terms of, you know, what explicitly, you know, they were kind of providing as a guideline, but I'll, I'll take a step back and give you at least, you know, my hypothesis about it. Uh, I think, you know, when you think about bias, uh, to me, there's a very simple way to address bias, whether it's driven by data or it's driven by algorithms. And the way you address that is making sure there's diversity on the data science teams. Uh, the easiest way, if you think about the Amazon example, about when you know, you know, they tried to use it for screening CVs, they had a data set that was basically old, that had more male applicants, and the fact that they had a you know a team that was not very diverse in terms of the data science team, they didn't pick it up. But if you have a diverse data team, they will pick these things up. With, whether there's a bias in the data or anything else, you'll pick it up. I think the second part of it is there's a lot of innovation that can help to figure this out. And a lot of startups who are trying to address these things, whether it's through synthetic data and things like that. So I think those are two ways to address it. But uh, I couldn't at least on my own kind of uh, parse through the executive order and see exactly what they meant. But I think those are two practical ways to handle it. Yeah, I think there'll definitely be further conversation about that. But definitely start by, uh, yeah, at the bottom, AI by design and also have your team designing AI look like the people who are going to use it so that it, it reflects it well. Cool. Well, I think that wraps us up uh, for today. I want to say many, many thanks, Anik, for joining us. Um, your insights were invaluable. Um, this was recorded, uh, so I think everyone will get a, a copy in their inbox uh, later. Um, and we thank the audience for joining us. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Nina. Thank you. Bye.